Hi, uh, this is Jack Stanley, and I wanted to speak a little bit on something a little different, like what was it like to work for Edison? You know, we have all of our stories about Edison and the history of Edison, but was he a good person to work for? Was he an easy person to work for? Uh, was he difficult? And how did various people look at Thomas Edison. So I wanted to share a little bit of this with you because it's not an area that's talked about too much. We often talk about Edison, but we don't talk too often about those that watched Edison or worked with him. He had a lot of interesting assistants going through the years. You know, Charles Batchelor was very important to him and Edison uh, adored Batch, as he called him. And, of course, Bachelor was, in many respects, the hands of Edison. You know, he, he was very good with his hands. He had worked with uh, thread and threading machines when he had met Edison. And, and of course, then you had John Cruzy, who was a, a Swiss, a Swiss uh, mechanic and had been a watchmaker. So he was very, very good and wonderful at creating and making uh, prototypes. And of course, you know, going all the way back to the beginnings with like the phonograph, um, Edison had been working with Bachelor for months beforehand on trying to come up with a device that would capture sound. And they had made these rudimentary noises on wax paper going into the summer of 1877. And the tinfoil phonograph, of course, comes out in December and that's when they had basically everything kind of figured out how to do it. And of course, even the day before, you know, before Edison announces the phonograph, Cruzy and Bachelor are, are making sure it works. Because you've got to understand something. If Edison's going to work with a prototype and he has his people working on it, of course, they want to make sure it works before they give it to Edison. And so they did test it. I mean, they did make some recordings. And, and there are a number of recordings or sounds or going hoy or ahoy and, um, you know, what is this? Uh, and other things said on either foil or on wax paper. And uh, Edison wanted to have a prototype that would work if he was going to sit there and play with it. And that's why he had these people doing this stuff. And so, of course, things were tested beforehand. Uh, when it came to the incandescent light bulb, of course, it was lots of work and stuff like that. And that was the that was the meat and potatoes time of, of, of Edison, when he had that small group of individuals with him and they were just tossing out patents, you know, almost on a daily basis. And he said he wanted to have a minor invention every week and a big invention every month or something, every six months or so. And, and, and for a while, they were pretty much doing that kind of stuff. And, um, but as Edison becomes more a businessman, as becomes more an industrial um, manufacturer, he, he takes on very different roles and he, he looks at things very differently and he's surrounded by lots and lots of people. And all of these people learn how to deal with Edison because as Edison ages, Edison isn't the carefree kind of funny individual he was when he was in his 20s and 30s. When he's in his 60s and 70s, he's a little bit more cantankerous, uh, very sure of what he says. And the most important thing of all was never to counter what Edison said. If Edison tells you something and it's completely wrong, he's right. You know, there's that old, that old thing, rule number one, I'm always right. Rule number two, when wrong, see rule number one. That more or less kind of fits Edison. And it's interesting and there's a couple of interesting stories I wanted to share. There was a fellow, uh, A. H. Johnson, who worked for Edison in the diamond department. Now, the diamond department, of course, was making the diamonds for the styluses, you know, for the Amberola or for the diamond disc. And Edison 
bought a whole pile of used diamonds from Henry Ford. And they had been used under supremely high heat. And so Johnson was working with it. And he realized almost immediately that this shipment of diamonds was diamonds that were no good for the purpose for which Edison wanted. But he couldn't tell Edison that. So what he did, he contacted Meadowcroft, Edison's assistant, his secretary, and said that he, he wanted to see Edison because we're having trouble trying to make the diamonds work. And we need his help. And so yeah, Meadowcroft concert, uh, contacted Johnson, and Johnson went to see and said, and he said, there's something wrong with the boys over at the Diamond Point area. They can't get the diamonds to work right. So Edison said, send them over to me. I'll look them over. And a few days later, Johnson uh, got a call from Meadowcroft telling him that the diamonds were no good. Well, they knew they were no good, but they could not tell Edison that. This is the important thing, and this kind of held up things a lot at the Edison Company. Lots of people would sit there and say, we know this isn't going to work. But nothing could be done until Edison realized it couldn't be done. And sometimes that could hold things up a long, long time. Um, he would work on his math problems and stuff, and Theodore would come to him and say, there's an easy way to do this. And Edison would just growl at Theodore and say, I'll do it my own way. And uh, there were other things that, that happened. This is an interesting story that I found uh, going through some of the papers. And there was a fellow named Dougherty who was working for Edison. And uh, they were trying to extract nickel from the sand up in New Village. And Edison worked out his plan. And Dougherty worked out his plan. And he presented it to Edison who said it was no good and told Dougherty to work on his plan. And Dougherty looked at it immediately and said, this is nonsense. And he continued working on his plan so he could get the thing done, so Edison could get the work going. Well, about a month or two later, they had a meeting in the library. And Dougherty was explaining the plan to Edison, and Edison noticed that Dougherty wasn't doing Edison's plan. And he said, you're not using my plan. And Dougherty said, because it's rotten, it doesn't work. And Edison just exploded, screamed, ranted, and raved, and charged out of the library. A half an hour later, Dougherty was told that his services were no longer needed, and he left. And then Edison spearheaded the program and discovered that his plan didn't work. <laughs> and so then he told uh, Medikoff, get Dougherty back. And Dougherty obviously told them what to do with their ideas, and it was all over and done with. They had to kind of use Dougherty's plan, and Edison just kind of used it. I mean, it was there, and it worked. But Edison would often come up with these ideas, and the ideas wouldn't quite work. But the thing is that uh, you couldn't tell him that. In fact, there's an interesting time that uh, one of the people working there came by the chemical laboratory, and out came Edison red-faced. And he looked at the, the fellow, and he pointed to himself, and he said, world's greatest inventor, world's greatest damn fool and stormed down the, <laughs> the causeway in between the buildings. <laughs> and, and other times Edison would do other kind of crazy things. You know, once again, you had to let Edison decide and you could never tell him he was wrong. And he would do demonstrations of his records, like throwing them down to show they wouldn't break. And one day he had some dignitaries over and he did it. And the record broke. <laughs> and they said many people got a lesson in some four-letter words they had never heard before. <laughs> now, other things that would happen, you know, Edison did some of the hiring. 
and some of the firing. But sometimes his firing got a little weird and strange. He would look at profits. And if he'd see that profits were down, he would just spring into action and go on his firing rates. Now, people in the know, people that worked at the company and, and knew Edison well enough, knew when they saw him storming, and we're not talking about gently walking. I mean, his fists are clenched and he's just charging into a building. They knew to get the hell out of the way, go in the bathroom, go somewhere, but just get out of his direct path. There's a wonderful story about this fellow that was there for an interview. And uh, it was in the, the chem, uh, chemical uh, lab building, um, the battery building, excuse me, the battery building. And he was sitting there in the hallway on a chair waiting for his interview. And here came Mr. Edison charging down the hall like a steam locomotive. And Edison stopped right in front of him and says, what's your name? And he gave him his name. And Edison looked at him and says, you're fired. And then he stormed off. Now, the fellow sat there and said, I hadn't even been hired yet. And so when the uh, fellow that was going to interview him came out to meet him and, and, and he told his story to the fellow that was going to interview him, he said, oh, don't listen to the old coot. And he got hired. <laughs> But Edison would do that to a lot of people. And a lot of times people would just shuffle it off. But Edison would remember sometimes and he'd see someone and say, didn't I fire you? And then he would fire him again and, and uh, do stuff like that. Um, you know, the people that worked in the factories weren't too fond of Edison. The people that worked in the laboratory loved him. Very two different worlds. Um, one of the things I found out that was kind of interesting as well is that uh, Edison would give praise and give condemnation almost in the same tone, like you did a great job, congratulations, you made a mistake, don't do it again, blah, 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 blah. The fellow that protected Edison a lot was William Meadowcroft, and he was his trusted secretary for many, many years. And he took care of so much, he protected Edison. And many times he protected Edison from Edison. Uh, Metacorp was from Boonton, New Jersey, and uh, he uh, he would take care of the meeting with the, the fellow who were taking the test, the ignoramus test for the advance or quality men, as they called them. Um, also, uh, he would be an envoy for Edison for special events and take care of things and whatever, whatever needed to be done. He also guarded Edison. Now, here's an interesting thing. And we don't talk about this much, but, you know, we know Edison had hearing loss. Yes, indeed. He did have hearing loss. But whenever Edison was napping, there would be signs put on the door of the office in the laboratory saying, be, please be quiet. And they wanted no noise to wake up Mr. Edison. Now, the interesting thing is, if you can't hear, why do you need these signs? Edison could hear certain sounds. He could hear different sounds. As I've mentioned before, certain sharp sounds would wake him up. And, and he snored pretty loudly, too, because, as I mentioned, I talked to Gurdon Mayfield, and Mayfield recalled very much the sound of Mr. Edison working on a new invention, which Mr. Meadowcroft would say, he'd meet you at the door and say, you can't come in. Mr. Edison's working on a new invention, and you could hear him snoring away, working on that invention. Uh, he always rode in a Model T Ford, and people would see him in the factories, you know, with the... Uh, there's a fellow named... Uh, I think his name was Johnny Griffin, if I'm not mistaken. And he would drive for Edison occasionally. And he liked him because he, uh, he, uh, he chewed tobacco too. And so the two of them chew and spit. And Ernest Stevens had the misfortune of riding in the back of the Model T one time when the two of them were chewing tobacco. And he was getting spattered by tobacco juice, wearing a white suit, of course. So Edison... Um, working for him 
there were certain things you had to follow, certain rules you had to follow. You never, ever uh, contradicted what he said. And if you found that he was incorrect, you had to let Edison understand he was incorrect. And that could take a long, long time. Um, Theodore uh, mentioned that he got into some really troublesome times with his father. His father would ridicule him in front of people at times. And, and he, he, he learned just to stay back and spend time working on what he was working on until he decided to form his own company. Um, and uh, his little company basically did what Theodore liked, and he was separate from his father and, and stayed there for, for many, many, many years. One last thing to mention, um, Edison was an individual that was bigger than life. And he was told he was bigger than life, and in time he kind of believed it. And so working with Edison, especially as he gets older, the fictitious character and the actual character somehow merged into one. And Edison becomes somewhat a little bit of a caricature of himself. And that's how the Edison Company would work in its later years. It was horribly outdated. Uh, it was an old, styled company. And new ideas were constantly flowing in, and Edison was rejecting them all. And as soon as Edison passes away in 1931, within months, the laboratories closed. Most of the areas of the machine shops are all closed. And the factories continue. It's, it's not no longer a place of innovation, although there is some small innovation here and there on existing products. But the, um, the company itself is manufacturing and, uh, and uh, would remain so until it uh, kind of goes out of business around 1965 and is kind of absorbed by other companies. It's, it's kind of sad in some respects. The Edison Company was brilliant and amazing in its earliest days, but it slowly, slowly degraded and, uh, and finally ended its days in the 1960s. I remember as a little boy going to the Edison uh, Laboratory uh, under the Park Service in 1964 because the factories were still running. And it was interesting to see. You'd see the smoke coming out and all kinds of stuff. And within a year of that, it was all over. Um, but uh, it was fascinating at that time for me to see because it was a kind of a different place then because there was still lots of stuff all over the place and all the old timers are there who had worked with Edison. And, and, and the myth of Edison, the... The, uh, the story of Edison that was a little bit idealized was the one that was told at the time. You really didn't get to know Edison as a person, per se. You got to see the Edison of, of romance, of, of, of uh, basically, of stylized fiction. Today, we look at Edison a little differently. We realize he was human, <laughs> and he had its faults, his failings, and his wonderful points, his brilliance. Uh, he did a lot of great things, and he did a lot of crazy things, and that's part of being human. And so I just wanted to talk about him, just as working with him, what it was like. Um, he was a unique individual, and his company was very unique. And uh, I don't think we'll ever see anything of the likes of that again. So, thank you.